because we have, we have, we have enough time. There is a topic I would like to, to be speaking on today. We, I think I've finished my series on, on serving God. Uh, so today I want to speak on something else. And I want us to open our Bibles in Hebrews 13, sorry, Hebrews 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Hebrews 3, 12 to 13. Uh, if you're there, I would like to read. I can still hear pages coming. I want to give you time. My lecturer in college is to tell us many people tend to open so that they can follow. So I'm giving you time. If you're there, I can see if you're ready. Hebrews 3, chapter 12. I mean, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Um, this is what the Bible says. Say to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful and believing heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end of the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for your word. We want to pray that, Lord, you're going to use me as a vessel as I speak this word to us. That if this word will not only be enlightening and life-changing to the congregation, but also to myself as one sharing this word. We thank you, Lord. Visit with us. Speak to our hearts today. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, I would like to speak on a topic I'm calling the deception of sin. Deception of sin. Utanganyifu wa dhami. I hope I'll be very careful. There's some words that I may have to uh, interpret them in Kiswahili for all of us to be able to be together. I'm talking about the deception of sin. Uh, before I continue, receive greetings from a place, Christian Reform Church of Mangatini, Juba, South Sudan. They never send me greetings, but this time they send me greetings. So it's good for me to bring the greetings. I was there this past week, training pastors, and we had a good time, uh, except for the heat, but uh, it was a beautiful thing. So, the deception of sin. One of the things that we need to understand that the world has really changed. People do not fear sin. People do not fear anything that goes against God's word. And there's something that the world is doing now through what we call the New Age Movement, telling people that truth is only decided by you. What you think is true, we call it a relativism. If it is true with you or it is right with you, nobody should tell you that it is wrong. And so it has crept into the church where we even sometimes uh, are always afraid of talking about sin because you're going to rub people the wrong way. But let me tell you something. If we are in church and we cannot talk about sin, then we have no business being in church. Because one of the biggest problems that the church is undergoing right now in the world is because of sin. The people who brought us the Bible, the Word of God, are the ones who are promoting LGBTQ, they are the ones who are promoting drugs and crime and all those things are wrapped up in one. But now, when it comes to us as a church, we must talk about sin in a way that you're going to help the people that we are with. I would rather tell people go with me to heaven than carry a bunch of people who are going nowhere. Because sin has a very disabling um, a characteristic to the life of a person. Because when you get to a place where you don't fear sin, the Bible says that uh, the, the such people, their minds are seared like with a hot iron, which is nothing scares them. If they need to talk about what they have done, then nothing scares them. And they don't care uh, what, what is happening in their lives. You see, when you look at uh, the book of Genesis chapter 3, you know the story of creation, the Garden of Eden, and then the, the episode between uh, the devil and the serpent and, the, and Eve, and the eating of the fruit, and the hiding in the, in the garden, when God is coming to look for them, they are saying, uh, they are asking, where, where, where are you 
say they are hiding uh, because we are naked. I don't know who told them in the first place they were naked because when they were created, they were created naked. So because of sin and disobedience, they discover that they are naked. And you know, one of the things that you need to know in the Garden of Eden, uh, the snake uh, who represents Lucifer or the devil or Satan, whatever name that you may want to call him, promised them something that he was not going to deliver. And one of the things that you need to understand, the deception of sin and the allure of the world, allure of the world is the attraction that the world gives to us. Promises us things that the world will not be able to, to bring about to pass. And I want to say this, when I look at the events in the garden and what is happening today, you will discover that the world is promising things that it will not be able to deliver. And I think I've said it here before, one time ago, when I was preaching about, I think I mentioned it in one of my sermons about sin, that the cost of sin is always higher than the advertised price on sin. For example, if I have seen a bottle of chana is being sold at 50 shillings, it may be very cheap, but the cost of me taking that chana is higher than the 50 shillings that is on the bottle of the chana, if you understand what I'm saying. And that's the same thing. Sin gives you temporal excitement, temporal goodness, a, a temporal feeling of goodness that will not take you anywhere. The, as soon as that feeling comes about, it disappears immediately it comes because it is not permanent. And that is the allure of sin. That is why when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, the fruit was very sweet. When Eve ate it, he took the fruit and took it to the husband and said, eat, this is a good fruit. The serpent had said that when we eat this, our eyes will be open and we will not die. And you know the whole story. Their eyes were opened to something very different. They discovered that the grace of God has lifted from their eyes. And they went to hide because they were naked. And initially they were naked, but they were not afraid. Huh? They were not afraid of being naked, but they discovered. You know, one of the things that sin does, it brings in the law into your life so that you can be able to see your nakedness. And once you see that nakedness, some people want to stay in that nakedness. They know how to deal with it. They say, after all, everyone is doing it. You know, that's how sin comes in. Because everyone is doing it, then it becomes something that is good uh, for us to be able to do. Uh, so, one thing we know that some of these gifts that are brought by sin, they have a temporal satisfaction. That's what they say in Swahili. Yeah? Even when you drink alcohol and you get high, you have a good feeling, but in the morning you are sore. If you are trying to hide your troubles in the alcohol, in the morning the troubles will come double. The troubles will still be there and you will have a hangover. And you will not be able to function well the following day. So, the gifts of sin have temporal satisfaction that quickly disappear as soon as they have come. So, in short, what I'm saying, the cost of sin will always be higher. The real cost of sin will always be higher than what has been advertised. Remember the serpent telling Adam and Eve, did God say, you see, it starts from where what you know. Did God say that you should not eat this? He said, yes, he said you can eat everything except this. He said, you know, if you eat this, you shall get wisdom and you will not die. And he thought this is very good. And that's how sin comes. For example, when you see an advertisement on TV, and they're advertising a television set, for example, and then you look at your TV, do those TVs still exist? I used to have one. We know the moment that you know it was so heavy. And then you look at the one that is being advertised. You can put a LCD. You can put a LED. You can put a smart TV. You can a LED. You can put a digital. So you know what happens is with the advertisements, you want to always change the product that you have to have a better one. That is why the fashion one will always bring a new type of a dress, a new type of a shoe, to just to satisfy your appetite for good things. And you know sometimes those things do not last. You can buy a very good dress and in a short while it will not be fitting you. Because you have eaten some slightly more ugali and then the dress, you start saying, we have to be The dress does not become smaller, it is you who becomes bigger. 
Is it true? Yeah? And that's how sin is. Sin lies to you that this thing is very good. I'm trying to explain myself before I come to, to the meat of what I want to talk to about. But all of these we must do, we must reject the gifts that Satan promises if we have to survive as believers. We have to reject. They look very nice. The Alua is beautiful. Remember the children of Israel when they went into captivity in Babylon, Daniel chapter 1. The young men were promised very good things, a good education, good food, eating at the king's table, and all that. But because they knew the danger of what they were going to put themselves into, as young as they were, because they had a background from their parents, they had been taught well. They say in verse 8, I have purpose within my heart, not to define myself this way. How many of us can say no to some of these good things that bring temporal satisfaction? How many of us? If you are a young girl and a girl comes and tells you you are beautiful, you know that one breaks your heart. Nobody has told you, even your parents have never told you you are beautiful. <laughs> parents who are you tell their daughters they are beautiful. Because there are some hyenas who will come around and tell them they are beautiful. And the hyenas are looking for meat. They are not looking to, to, to lift the, the spirit of someone. And you know what I mean by hyenas? See, you are always busy with a I don't know why there is that name to men, but men are very good creatures. You will be wrong. We are very good creatures. I hear some people are wondering, they are saying, Pastor, you are not speaking the truth. We have graduated from being dogs, now we are hyenas. <laughs> Listen to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. This, you can imagine, many, many, many centuries after Moses had died. This is what the writer of Hebrews, I tend to believe it is Paul, but don't say Pastor said it is Paul. Theologians have argued about the author of, of Hebrews. But the evidence points to him, also it is never indicated that it is him. But the writing style, the way he speaks in that uh, book, speaks like Paul. But don't say Pastor said. We normally say the writer is unknown. This is what he says in Hebrews 11.25. By faith, Moses, these are many, many centuries down the line, when he was, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Can you imagine? Moses is born when young, young children, young boys, when the, the Pharaoh had ordered that all children born below two years of, of age must be killed. And then the mother, being very bright, uh, that's why sometimes they love mothers, they think very quickly, fashion the basket and put it in there, and put in some tassel of water, that's it, and then sets the thing floating in the river. And then sends the sister, Miriam, to just hang around there to see who is going to come around. Then Moses is picked by Pharaoh's daughter when she comes down to bathe in the river. Uh, she picks the boy and says she's going to take care of the boy. And remember, uh, because God had, had, had a purpose for Moses, and the sister says, can I get a baby for you? And the sister runs and calls the mother. And sometimes you need to be clever. <laughs> so the mother comes and takes care of Moses, breastfeeding him and teaching him the word of God. So that after he had stayed in Egypt all that years, he had gone to the best schools, he had gone to the group of schools of Egypt. He had a high life. Actually, he was uh, taught to be uh, heir to the throne. Because he's one of the favorite sons in the in the, 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 the Pharaoh's palace. But then he refused all that. When he saw somebody uh, doing something bad against his own people, he killed that man. After 40 years of being brought up in the right place, the right education, he said, No, I'm not going to side with this side, I'm going to side with my people. And that's the same thing that happens to us. We must choose which side that we are on. If you are going to be on the side of God, you must be on God's side. If you are going to choose to be on the sinful side, please be there, but don't stay in the middle. Don't become a Christian wizard of a That you are red on the inside, you are green on the outside. The Bible says, if you are a local Christian, God will spit you from his mouth. Can you imagine if God spits you from his mouth? And the same thing that, that, that we need to always ask ourselves, which side are we on? Moses knew his side. 40 years he lived a very good life. But when God wanted to use him, he had to take him to wilderness for another 40 years to be brought down 
to the ground level. That issue of Egypt had to be gotten out of it. That is why after he took care of his father, he lost the sheep for 40 years. 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the wilderness. When God is calling him at the age of 80, he cannot be able to speak. Because he has not been, he has been speaking to sheep. He does not know how to speak to people. But he knew what he had chosen. And you can see his life. Because he chose the right way to go. But one of the things that we must see, I want us to look at the example of Samson in the Bible. The example of Samson in the Bible. He serves as a very great example where disobedience and sin can take someone. Disobedience and sin can take you places. And Samson is the best. I'm looking at the way he was born. The parents could not have a child. But then the angel of God appears to the mother and says, you're starving and you have no child, but you're going to get one. But this is what I want you to do. You are not going to drink any wine. You are not going to eat food that is unclean. And when the boy is born, do not put a razor on his head. On his head. Three things. But look at the way his life begins. When you come to chapter 14, when he's of age, the first thing he does, he gets equally yoked with women who was not supposed to. He goes down to the Philistines and he sees a beautiful woman and comes back and tells his parents, I'm going to marry this one. The parents try to advise him, but he does not listen. I want you to read the story of, 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 of Samson from I think uh, Genesis 12 or 13, going more forward. He does not listen. The parents are asking him, is there no good woman in your tribe, in your community, that you have to go down to our enemies, people who do not know God, but he insisted that he's going to go there. And you know, the life we are living today, that's exactly what happens, even in our young people. Many years ago, your parents were involved when you wanted to get married. They would go and spy if you have seen a girl, you tell them even before you say anything. They go and spy in that village. They know whether these people are witch doctors, whether they what kind of people are these. But nowadays, when do you go to your parents? When everything is already set, you already know you want to get married, you are saying, this is a girl and you are getting married in this year. Your parents sometimes, being your parents, they don't want to hurt you. They just agree to walk along you, but they pray that nothing happens. And I think also, uh, Samson's parents were like that. They didn't want to fight so much with their son. So remember, he has seen this Philistine woman. He goes down to, to see the relatives. On the way, he meets a lion. He kills the lion. Many years later, or many months later, when he comes back, honey, there's honey that has formed in the carcass of the lion. What does he do? He scoops honey from the lion, from the lion, and eats. What, 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 what commandment has he broken there? The mother was told no unclean foods. And you know, a dead animal was unclean. And then he goes further, he doesn't even tell the parents, he goes and gives them the same way, the same way he gave Adam the food to eat. He gives honey to the parents. They all break the law of eating unclean things. And that's the same thing. Even you look at our lives, follows the same pattern. The things that God says we should not do, the things that the Bible are very clear about, are the things that we want to do. They are the things that we always do, the things that God has said not to. Whether you are young, whether you are old, we all fall in the same category. Moses refused the allure of Egypt. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel refused the allure of Babylon. Today, if all of us are given visas to go to the US, we think that is a land of opportunity. Everybody will run there because there's something we see in the movies, what we hear people's stories about the US and the Britain and you know them. But they also want to go there, but for a visit. And for a visit. I know I can't die before I go there. I will go. But I'm not planning to go and live there. I'm not planning to go and work there. I want to go there and visit ministry wise and come back. Maybe go again and come back. But I'm not planning to migrate. Even there's a friend of mine that is recently called me. Every year I tell you to apply. I think this is the month people are applying for the green card. I always tell you to I will host you. I will host you when you come here. So I'm wondering, at 51, what am I going to do in the US? My children are here. 
My family is here. And I think I'm comfortable. I may not be rich. I may also not be poor. I can be able to make ends meet. So what am I going to do there? To go, what grip can I for? I don't want to go there to become cheap labor. Are you understand what I'm saying? But there's such a lure that they, they say they lack of opportunity. Everybody wants to go there. If I choose a country I want to go to, it's not even the US. I want to go to New Zealand. Can you understand what I'm saying? They just, they just like the name. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. The allure of the things of the world can push us to places where we do not want to go. So in Genesis chapter 16, we are going to look at a few things there uh, that, uh, so that we don't take so much time. But one thing I want us to know, look at the life of, uh, of, of um, the life of, of Samson. In verse 14, he sat with them, the wrong woman. He eats from the wrong place. And then later, he gives a riddle, and then the people use the same woman to get his secret. You remember the riddle that he asked for? He told them about, it was about the lion and the honey. Yeah? So, and then the, the, those Philistines, they use the woman to do what? To get the secret. And then because he knows that the woman has got the secret, he goes down there and kills his relatives. He's in those, 30 of them, and strips them of their wealth. You see, that's already a sin, sin of man. Okay. And then when you come to chapter 16, he meets another one called Delilah, a renowned prostitute. And that's where his problems began. And you know, the deception of sin is the first time you get involved in sin you, you, and you get away with it, you get courage to go to the next level. You see? This one is all just a woman from another community that they are not supposed to meet. Nice woman, marries a woman. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know, you, go, you went against what God wanted for him. But now he has gone a step further. Now he has seen a prostitute. And you know, he was not supposed to take any wine. But he was so used to what? To the drink. And that's how, that's how we do. We know this thing is wrong. But the allure of the temporal satisfaction makes us go to the next level. That is what chapter 6 is about. This is where his downfall begins. He starts very strong. We normally say he started, he didn't even start strong. And he finished bad, but he finished strong at the end. Yeah? This woman becomes his downfall. And it is only in there that he was able to know that his strength came from God. That is why when his hair grew after he had been shaved and he had no eyes, he asked God, give me a chance one more time. That is it. Imagine in death, that is when he recognizes that God is the source of his strength. And it is unfortunate that he has to die with the Philistines on the same day. They said, is it 3,000 of them? They all died at the same day. So, one of the things that we have to really be very careful about is where we take ourselves. Who do we mix with? Because the people you mix with are the people who are going to bring your downfall. If you have not, you know, I'm not saying you cannot have friends who are not believers. I have a few who are not believers. But how do you evangelize if you are not able to mix with people who are believers? Jesus evangelized by mixing with prostitutes, with tax collectors and sinners. Even the Pharisees were not very happy about it. But how strong are you if you hang out with those people? That's a question you need to ask yourself. Because they are also evangelizing you. If you are trying to evangelize people who are wicked, they are also trying to evangelize you. So many times we, we lose the battle and sometimes we win the battle. Some of us lose the battle completely, others win completely, others are in the middle. You win some, you lose some. But is that how God wants us to live? No. We must understand. So there are three things I want us to look at from the story of Samson in the book of Judges. Then we will end this. We need to, I think next week we are starting on, uh, on, on Thanksgiving. Three things in the book of Judges 16 that sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Uh, this one you can read from verse 4 to 20, but I'm not going to read the whole of that chapter. I am going to read verse 7 and 11 and 13. This is what the Bible says. We, we know at first he had no intention of telling the lady her secret in verse 17, the liar. But then later he was, he was finally broken and gave by the constant enticements of the liar. That is verse 7, 11, 13, 15.
15 and 17. Let, let me just do those skipping like that. Let's start with verse 7. Verse 7 says, Verse 7 says, uh, Samson answered her, If anyone ties me with seven fresh tongues that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. You see, he starts by lying. Lying is also a sin. He was not supposed to give out a secret, but now he's lying. Uh, because he's mixing with the wrong people who are asking the wrong questions, he has to lie about his source of strength. Sometimes when we are Christians and we are hanging out with the wrong people, we are afraid of telling them that we are born again. We are afraid of telling them why we are what we are. And I remember here one time I told you, there are some people in the, in the office and you call them and you, you tell them in Kisonini, when I used to ask if you were born for because other people are listening, they don't want to say Amen. I'm as if you were when I was you, sana sana. Eh? Because they don't want the other people to know that they are born again. And that is where Samson is at that particular point. Listen to verse 11. Verse 11 says, He said, If anyone ties, my sex, ties me securely with new rocks that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. That's another lie. He's lying. Eh? A man of God lying very seriously. Verse 13. Delilah then said to Samson, Until now you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tired. Are you seeing now? Delilah is also getting impatient. You don't tell people the truth and you continue hanging around them. Many times, I'm very sure most of you have got to call alumni associations of the schools where you went to. So we have a, a high school a, a, a alumni association. So once periodically we have a gathering. And one of the things that I've always done, it is good to go and connect with the people you went to, to high school. Like I remember our first, our first one was 25 years after high school. We were meeting for the first time, sometime in 2016. This is still somewhere there. For the first time, 25 years. You know, you meet people, they say the name, you know the name, but the face you don't. They were, they were your class. Because 25 years, people have changed. And also, as a Christian, the time that you have been around, maybe away from those people, they do not know you are a or they have heard you are a Christian. I know the first thing they asked me, we had you became a pastor. I said yes. And I made it very clear to them. Right now they don't post rubbish on the WhatsApp group. People used to post even pornographic videos of the world. And men in their fifties. 40s, that time they were late 40s. I told them I will leave the group if you don't stop doing this thing. So when we meet up, the first session of people are pleasantly talking and taking soda, and then uh, and meet, and then uh, suddenly when the time flies a bit, we start hearing Jameson, Pilsner, Tasker. You know, that is the time they don't know when we left. Why? Because if I had found seated with them drinking, what will I tell people? What will I tell God? I remember one time. Many years ago again, I used to like watching those and remember the place where I used to live. I used to go, I, I love, I love so, so I was going to watch a Manchester United match, the best team in the world. I was going to watch that match. <laughs> so why not yet? So I was going to watch that match. When I came back, the first thing my daughter asked me, I think she was five. My first one daughter, she was five years. She asked me, Dad, Unena Bona Pira Kwaba, Nawalefe. That is the last time. I went there. So I discussed with some people who are offering the services in the estate. So they pulled me away to the house. So I watched football in mine. Because my daughter reminded me that I'm a You know, I was saying, no, I'm not going to drink. I just watched the soccer match and leave. And you know, sometimes when you're watching soccer and there's a crowd and people are screaming themselves out. But you know, watching soccer alone in the house, you will always sleep before the game is over because you are alone. Yeah? And the people who are supposed to help you support are not interested. They are not interested. Stop looking at someone. I didn't mention people today. So, so that is what happens. So sometimes it becomes very hard uh, for you to be convinced people. If you do not have a stand, people will pull you to their side. Sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. Listen to verse 15. It says, verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you would confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. You, and you know you have done and you keep 
keep telling me you love me. Is that very familiar? Hmm? If you love me, prove it. That's a young girl being told by a young man. Prove that you love. If you prove the story, it will be discussed later of what will happen. Even if nothing happens after that, but at least you know there's a separation between you and God. I know you are adults, you know what I'm talking about. The letter is using the word love to get the secret out of him, to pull him, to pull him to her side. And then listen to verse, uh, verse 17. 17 says, So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazareth, set apart to God since far. If my head were shaped, my strength would lead me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Samson tells the liar where his weakness, where his weakness lies. And the liar uses the truth of where his strength lies, I don't know, is his, his weakness. He uses, she uses that to get the secret out of him. And then he, he is enticed, he is shaped, and you know the rest of the story. What happened? The allure of sin must be rejected from the first. Mufuto wadami, lazima ukatai, kutoka mwanzo. Ukiona dalili ya mtu ambaye nataka kukuingiza kwa dami, ama kitu chochote ya macho kinataka kukuingiza kwa dami, the first thing that you must do, lazima ukatai. Proverbs 4, 14 to 15, this is what the Bible says. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Anything that looks evil, do not follow that path. Because at the end of it all, you will discover that where we are with the men, may be of a box. Remember the story of Joseph? Hmm? By the way, in other words, Joseph was a handsome, funny-looking young man. And the lion, no, not the lion, Potiphar. Uh, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife loves him and wants to have some peace of him. The other says he was handsome. When you are described by a woman as handsome, it is true. When you tell your handsome, because somebody wants something from you. But when the Bible records something, it means exactly Joseph was very handsome. But when he heard what the woman said, he took off. But before he took off, what did he tell the woman? That I do not want to sin against my God. He didn't say, I don't want to sin with you. He said, against my God. Because he, he, he was brought up, he knows what God was in a situation like that. When the woman insisted, he took off. He was ready for the consequences. He took off and left his spot there. The woman was very and look at this one. He tried to help me. But the truth is, he was able to repent sinning against you, against God. You know most people, I find a kama paka. Mwisho na paka ikiiba samaki. There's a friend of mine in India, he had to keep paka. He used to hate cats. But one time he was so broke and he, there was a cat in their home. Then the cat goes out and comes up with a whole fried fish. So I can't believe I can say my pan. I eat samaki, I can't allow the cat to paka. I can't eat samaki. So they treat it very well because it's the same at that particular time. Eh? But at least if you cut in something, it cleans itself up. And sometimes as Christians, that's what we do. We eat, we sin, and then we try to clean ourselves up. We come here, we lift our hands and praise God. We come here and give long testimonies or preach monies in, in the name of testimonies so that people can think who is still a Christian. But it is you who knows where the allure of the world is. You must reject any form of evil that comes your way. The other thing we need to also know is that sin, when given a chance, will always progress into further evil. That's why our first point is sin will always take you further than you wanted to do. It will always progress into further evil. Let us read Romans 16, 7 to 18, those two verses. Uh, are you putting up any verses here? Romans 16, 17 to 18. It says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teachings you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetite. 
by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive people. There are people who will be in your circle that do not mean well for you. As if by their smooth talking, they will deceive you. And some of us are not very keen in observing, in, in designing the people that you are hanging out with. And once they know your gun is down, they will pull you to their side. And before you realize it, what has gone under the bridge? That's what sin does. When you hang out with people who are sinful. You know, there's a story I had about some two gentlemen who went to hunt. Now the story again of a hyena is coming back. Now this time is not men, it's a real hyena. So these guys went to hunt. When they go to the forest, the whole day they lie in wait, they're waiting for a gazelle or something so that they can get some meat. Nothing comes. The only thing that kept passing before them was a hyena. I think I said, by the way, one of them tells the other guy, by the way, why don't we just shoot an arrow you so, so that this thing is safe? The boy says, no, we want to eat a hyena. The other guy says, no, no, we just shoot it and, and we allow it to stay short. So they continue waiting. It is short, it is lying there. And then there is still no animal. Then this guy tells his, his brother, the one they are hunting him, by the way, how does a hyena look without the skin? <laughs> The boy says, now I'm convinced you want to eat, to eat this thing. He says, no, no, we'll just skin it and leave it there. After some time, there's nothing. They say, by the way, how this thing look roasted? The guy said, now I know you want to eat. He says, no, no, it will just roast it and leave it there. Roasted. By the end of the day, you know what they did? They ate the hyena. And that's what the same thing we do with sin. He said, by the way, if I just there's nothing wrong with this. You know how people start drinking? I know different cultures. There are some cultures where people drink as socially, even Christians. But I'm talking about our African culture. Christians don't drink. So you say, let me just test. Because there's nobody here. I just take a bottle of wine. I'll just take some wine. I understand the Bible says wine is good for the stomach. Even the wine for you, the pass. Test. They said, ah. You see, there's nothing. Just take more. Before you know it, in a short while after staying with those friends for some time, you have moved from wine to the harder stuff. That is how sin comes in. The same thing, oh, I, I, I am a good man, I just hang with sisters, they are my friends, and we don't talk many things, we just discuss the geography teacher in school and then we discuss uh, chemistry and biology. Before long, you discover they discuss other things apart from the geography teacher. And I say, sometimes nothing may happen. Nothing may happen. But remember, there's a God in heaven. You know, one of the things that people are afraid of is getting pregnant. Another thing people are afraid of maybe is getting. They even, you know, I was, I was reading an article, I read a lot with young people. Uh, I was reading an article that said young people are, are more afraid of getting pregnant than getting HIV. Pregnancy is what scares them. What will I tell people? What will I say? But they are not afraid of diseases. They are not even afraid of their separation from the presence of God. They are not afraid. All they are afraid of is getting pregnant. And you know that the rest of the story how it was. You shot the hyena, you skinned it. It is a step by step. By the way, backsliding is not an event. It is a process. It starts somewhere and then it ends up here. What we see is a product of a journey that you have walked. It starts somewhere. You start by compromise. When you compromise, when people see you are compromising, when people tell you, you become prideful. You start showing some pride. I know what I am doing. Uh, you can't tell me. I am an adult. You know that. When the water goes under the bridge, now you stop becoming an adult. You want assistance. And you still assist you when that time comes. Sin always grows worse and worse. I'm still on point one. And even hardens the heart. It grows worse and worse. That's why I said when you start, it only takes the Holy Spirit for you to stop. That is why the first thing that Samson started with is a Philistine marrying a Philistine woman. Mufilist. He was equally being yoked by somebody they were not of the same faith. The second thing, he eats an unclean food. 
It goes on and on. It goes to the line. It goes down to the valley. And the Lord says, He likes fair women from the valley below. And you know the valley represents the lowest place. I remember there was a time our parliamentarians, it was said that they were seen along Koinange Street. Those who know what Koinange Street stands for at night. Some of them refused others, but then they always said, I was not there. Another said, You are saying that I will sue you. I was at home. People said, Yes, you can finish it. Koinange Street can take a plane, which is only 45 minutes to the post. <laughs> he kept quiet. And people started producing receipts. Another one flew with a woman, drove to the woman to Nyawuru, said, You are spoiling my name. My wife and my family, my in laws are making noise. We are all shut up. These are the receipts. That's what I'm saying. Sometimes you start doing something, you do not ask yourself where this thing is leading. At some point, it will, anything that you do under the table will always be brought to light. When the devil gives you a gift, he gives it to you in a hidden place. But when you are being exposed, actually, he's the first person to expose you and to laugh at you. Because that is what he wants. Hebrews 4, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened to have tested their heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tested the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age. If they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because of their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. What is what is Hebrews saying here? That Mutu Ambai Ameopoka. There is a hard thing for a man to do is to try to evangelize somebody who knows the truth and they are falling away from the truth. That is why we have a lot of compromise in the church. People sin and they don't. They don't know. I remember a church where I used to be a pastor. A girl gets pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. So it is announced in church, so he's expecting a baby. Uh, she was leading this particular group, now she has to step down, blah, blah, blah. And we want to check her out until the baby is born, blah. And then after the service, after the service, all the other girls are surrounding her, touching her, are controlling the baby. And told him, baby, but they're touching it and saying, hey, Tuna, you are doing very well. You see, even those people who are surrounding her, Yes, we need to give those people support, but we seem to be encouraging what they have done. And let me tell you something. If you're going to be a Christian and you're encouraging something, something somebody has done, people must know that what they have done is not right. Yes. And you have to make it very clear to them that what they have done is not right. And in the process, even once they know and they repent, we start a process of rehabilitation for that person, for that life. But if you hide sin, if you know and you keep quiet, it's not going to help that person. And sometimes we do not discipline because we are perfect. Even Jesus said, no one is perfect. But there is a journey we have walked. There is a journey somebody here has walked. They can be able to help. Because in that journey they have walked, they also had battle. They won some, they lost some. And I've said that here before. I don't stand here because I'm a perfect person. I've had a share of my a, a fair share of my battles that I've lost and won. Some of them I correct, some of them I have to leave with. But if you had to say, some of us are giving people to help us in our early years, that's why we are here today. But if you have been working in Christianity for 20 years and you are doing the same, same things, then it means your conscience was here with our water a long time ago. Where even when you are being corrected, you become angrier <laughs> than the people you have seen again. You know, by the end of when somebody sins in church, all of us are affected. All of us are affected. Especially sexual immorality. Because the Bible says that is a sin that is done within the temple. Kwahe kan we amu. To kiba. To kesabu sadaka uchukwe kido ukibie. Not to kusame, to kambia weka apane. Nima sana toka kasaraka. Fanya asha. But sexual sin. God gives sex very jealous. That's why sometimes we need to talk about the subject of sex with young people. God gives it very jealous. You, if you have made that mistake before, you, may, you must have corrected. If you are a Christian, the Bible says the old has gone, the new has come. Now you can live a newer life, a better life than the one you lived before. And nobody should judge you for your past life. But you will look at your life. If you say you are a Christian and I'm your pastor, then I am, I am responsible for what happens to you or what you do. I will be, I'll, I'll, I'll give an account to God. So if I don't 
come to you and sit you down and correct you, then I have seen it, even myself. That's why the Bible warns us in Galatians, even when you want to correct somebody, you must do that from a point of humility, so that you do not sin. The second thing I would like us to see uh, from the story of um, so story of Samson, the first one said, sin will take you further than you wanted to go. The second one, sin will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Longer than you wanted to stay. Listen to verse 20 to 21 of Judges 16. The Lord says, Then she called Samson. She called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. This time he has already been shaved. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. When you stay in sin, you stay longer than you intended. The, the Spirit of God that is supposed to get you leaves you. There are people who teach that once you say you cannot backslide. I don't want to go into that doctrine of eternal security. There are people who believe that once saved, they always, even if you see how that, that God is still, you know, you are still, you can be counted as one again. The Spirit of God departs from a person who stays in sin. There are people who continually sin and they do not repent. There's a difference. If you stay in sin, it says sin will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Like David, like Samson, sorry. You know, Samson had no intention of remaining bound. He had no intention. But because the Spirit of God that was his strength had departed, he had to stay bound. Before the Spirit of God was in him, with the two small mistakes he was making, the Spirit of God was in him. But when he stayed in sin, when he was bound by the Philistine, he stayed bound. Actually, they went further, they moved his eyes, they got out his eyes. No, when you go, you have eyes, but you can't see. Without, when you don't have eyes, there's a, there's a name. Yeah? There's a name. Ah, he could not see. So he stays there for some time until his hair grows. He, he stays, he, he stays calm. So he did not know that God had left him long time ago due to his actions. He, sometimes, as Christians, we do not understand that God has left us. We continue giving testimony. When I was spirit, when I was spirit, when I was spirit, no, but they will us to it. When us to we continue that language. We have learned it. I call it Christianese, like from the word Chinese. So we have a Christian language. When us to it, when us to it, China. Nico and Shoka. When us to it, Yosha. I'm talking about the top there. And I'm talking about the man. So what we do. You know, when we have those kind of long tests that we have memory, but there is no God in us. He has already left. So what is it? It's just a shell of what used to be. And sometimes you don't know it. Or sometimes you know it, but you pretend. When sin knows us, we often don't consider the bondage causes. I want to say here, sin can bind someone. That is why it's very hard to take people who are involved in things like drugs. It is very hard. The same thing, someone who is involved in immorality, it is very hard to rehabilitate. Actually, we are not going to be of the time for everything. We are not going to be When we experiment with sin, we overlook how it may bind our hearts. Because when it stays longer in you, your heart is bound. It becomes like a heart of stone that is described in the Bible. That's why one of the prophets, uh, the prayer is, uh, God, remove the heart and stone and give us hearts of flesh. Why do we need hearts of flesh? Hearts that can be molded. Those who use plaster sin and those who grew up in the village, there was no plaster and there was a, you get some clay. Uh, are you able to mold a stone? You are not. So sometimes you need to ask yourself some of those hard questions. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. He says, the God of this age. And remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, not now, not 10 years ago, many years ago. But then when you look at our lives, there is also the God of this age. The principalities in the high places that we always talk about in Ephesians chapter 6 is binding our hearts. And if you are not careful, it gets to a place where you can stay in church, a pastor will preach, and you say, let him finish, I need to go home. Because coming to church is something you come to meet your friends, 
you just come as a formality because at some point somebody will need to buy you uh, at some point your child will need to be dedicated at some point you need to get married and there should be a pastor to wed you those kind of things why do you come to church what is your reason of coming to church is it a formality how is the state of your heart what is the disposition of your heart what is the attitude of your heart when you are coming to church what are you looking for when you come to church that's a question that you need to ask yourself remember the story of the prodigal son with his pride he went to his father and said you know inheritance is given when somebody when a parent dies but he said give me my inheritance now and then he went out there to enjoy his inheritance in the process he sinned the money ran off he got to a place he was desperate and that's what normally sometimes happens. when you stay in sin you get to a place where now you're desperate you want to come out but you cannot because you're already bound so strongly that you can't get out and remember i said here one time that stronghold are the places where you are bound very strongly and each person has their stronghold and sometimes the devil uses the things that you like you, you you participated in in the past and I gave you an example. I never drank alcohol. I've never tested. God cannot test me with alcohol. The strongest drink I've taken is coffee. And the occasional malvai, you don't know malvai. And aloe vera leaves. I've taken that. Those are the most bitter things I've taken. God cannot, the devil cannot test me with those. He knows where to catch me. And those are the places where I must be very careful. Those are the places I must watch kill me so that it doesn't pass through that path. He does not pass through the path that you do not. That's what the Bible says. There are three things that is very hard to understand. <laughs> the, the, the way of a lion. And I like the third one. It says, the way of a young man with a baby. You may not be able to understand. Kijana ambaye hapo na mpezi. Hawa manamki ambaye hapo na mpezi. Na nivijana. Those are the worst people to advise. Have you ever tried to advise somebody? They go to that person and say, Pastor, say, you're not a good person. And once you stay in there, you'll get desperate as a point to say, Pastor, this idea. See, I want you and that's what we do. We speak in Proverbs, like Jesus, in parables. Yeah? I don't tell you directly because you're not here. So one time when your mind is sober, you will sit down and think, by the way, pastor said something. And I'm starting to see what he said. But if I tell you directly, at that particular point, your eyes are closed. They say love is. Does it love is what? Blind. No. The, the younger generation they say love is blind, so they don't know that one love is blind. During our time they used to say love is blind. That when you start loving someone, you, you become blind. How do you put an mirror? It depends on what you choose. Listen to John 8:34. John 8:34 says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. I'm talking about when you live in sin, live binds your heart. Your heart is bound by the sin, and you always find yourself doing it all the time and time, being involved in sin, and at a point where nobody can be able to tell you anything. He says, if you continue living in sin, you become a slave to sin. If you read Romans chapter 7, this is uh, Paul speaking to the Romans, and he's talking about himself. He says, that I know the things that are right, I'm paraphrasing, but I do not do them. But the things that are not right are the ones I find myself doing. That is the, the we call it in theology, the sin nature that you are born with. That is why, who teaches a child to steal sugar? Who teaches them? And when they are found, and they are the only ones in the house, and they sugar all over their face, and just, who stole the sugar? No. The first thing they tell me, it is not me. It is not me. Hata kuna kitu nini huwa nasema, watoto wanasema na sio mi. In a family there is another child called sio mi. So sometimes we need to find out this sio mi ni nani. Because I said, ukisa, nani ya maja sio mi. So the example is the appointment, who is called sio mi. You must find that sio mi. And deal with sio mi. 
so that you can know who it is. The sin nature, we are born with a sin nature. We have a tendency to want to sin. Because the way our bodies were, were created, we are created for entertainment. That's why it is easier to be called for a party and you change your plans the last minute. But if you are called for a prayer meeting, your grandmother is around, uh, you, you, you have a sick uncle, you have every No. But when you are told there is a party somewhere and somebody has just wrote a book, you break away all. In fact, you throw away your calendar and you are there in, in a matter of seconds. Because our bodies were made for entertainment. That's why it is easier. Uh, let's, let's dance here. We need to dance. But they say, let's wave our hands and worship the Lord. Everyone does this. Because our bodies were not created to subject themselves to the Spirit. It is you who must subject your body to the Spirit of God. So that the Spirit of God can work in your heart. Because the Spirit of God changes you inside out. But the devil wants to work from you outside, coming in. It is us who are supposed to do that. The last one, the last thing that we like to see from the story of David is that sin will always cost you more than you intended to pay. It will cost you more than you intended to pay. There are very many verses there we can read from verse 21 to 30, but those are very many. But one thing I want to say is that Samson's, re- Samson's recklessness with God's blessings cost him his sight, dignity, strength, freedom, and finally his life. In read verse 21, 25, and 30. His dalliance with sin cost him, number one, his sight. Give you a Kwanza and it will match. He was not able to see. Sin blinds you that you are not able to see the truth of God's word. The second thing is his dignity. Can you imagine dying together with sinners, the Philistines? Sin will cost you a dignity. Because the things that will be happening to your life, people will be wondering, is that so and so? What came of them? You know, now people start seeing you from a different, different light. And then your strength. What, what is the source of your strength? The Holy Spirit. When you depart, you lose your strength. And then freedom. You have no freedom. The way you mix with people freely. When you come where there are people, you think they know what you have just done. You know, there's the something called the guilt, the guilt conscious. You have done sin, you have wrong, you have sinned. And then when you go where people are, you think they know. I remember one time, I'm this firm person, I believe that I cannot leave the house without taking a bath. So one time, I wake up in the morning, some years ago, and there's no water anywhere. And I have to go to work. So I dress up, put some spray, because there's no water. So I go to the stage, and some of these look at me, I'm sitting there, they think I did not take a shower. When I get to the, to the, I'm sitting next to somebody in the matatu, they look at me, I'm saying, this person, am I smelling? <laughs> but I can smell the perfume. But it's only me who knows that I didn't take a shower. You know, some people, it's normal not to take a shower. It is, uh, it is more surprising when they take a shower for some people. So when I went to the office, when they, I, I'm with my colleagues, I want to stand at a distance because I, I'm feeling like, yeah, but going home, I discovered that I'm the only one who knows that I did tell And that's how sometimes it happens. When you see you have that guilty conscience, when you are with people, you think they can be able to smell your sin. You think they can be able to, when looking at you in the face, you think they are suspicious of something that I have done. Because, I do not think the worst thing is when you are walking around with guilt. It is the worst thing. You will not even have that freedom even to speak to God. When you close your eyes to pray, you can't close your eyes to pray. You will say, devil is reminding you, remember, 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 huh? remember the things that you just did 24 hours ago. Remember the things you did two days ago. You are not even that freedom that you have even with brethren. You are that even when you try to speak, you are, you are stammering because you don't know what to say because of the, of the sin that is hiding in you. So sometimes you need to be very careful. Choosing sin will cost you your soul too. Mark 8. 35 to 36. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to get the whole world yet for faith is soul? Sometimes sin cheats you. The lot of calling the law of the world cheats you that you can get everything. You can get anything that you want. You remember when Jesus was being tempted in Matthew chapter 4. He was shown the whole world. He told him, you just bow down and give you the world. Some of us, if we are promised such kind of things, we will succumb very easily. 
Because the problems that we have today, if you look at them, there's something I call, uh, I call it myself, this is what I call it, the, the theology of Sabbath, of resting. If you look at Egypt, when the Israelites were in slavery, they were not resting. Because the, the economy of Egypt was about production. So they had, they had to produce day and night. No resting. Even there's nothing like the Sabbath for them to go and pray. That's why God had to get them out of that, to go somewhere else and rest and worship God at some point. And the world today, we want so many things that we don't want to rest. You want to work and work and work over time. Over time. Let me tell you a secret. You know, one time I discovered this. Nowadays, I work, I travel, but I always make sure on the weekend I'm home. Why? I need to rest. On the weekend, I need to come to church. I can say that I can organize my talents even to include Saturday and Sunday. I rest for the I don't rest for the SBS and I also don't rest for the Sunday. I work eight days a week, 25 hours a day, if there's that kind of a thing. But God wants us to rest. And so the world tells you that you need stuff so that you can be recognized. You need to build a big house, which is not wrong. But at what expense? You need to drive a big car, but at what expense? You need to have children going to the to the group of schools, to the, the, the brain bands and all those. At what expense? I mean, I, let me tell you something. You need to be like me. When people talk about group of schools, they tell me I went to a group of schools. City Council schools, there are so many. It's a group of schools. Group of schools. Those others are group of schools, there are only three in the country. And I went to schools that are over 30,000. Group of city council schools. Government schools. That's a group of schools. It's something that should give you. You know, when people talk about uh, putting on expenses, some people go to shop in Paris. Eh? They go to buy their things in Dubai. Eh? You, you just cross the road here, take a matatu, take a palestine, you can shake it up. You can buy some second hand clothes. But who knows that you have second hand clothes? Did you know second hand clothes sometimes are even better than what you buy a booty clothes? I'm not inciting you. <laughs> but sometimes I ask myself, why would I put on a shirt that is 6,000 shillings and I can get the same shirt, even a higher quality at 250? At the name is some of you. Choosing sin will cost you God's fellowship. I'm saying, when you sin, when you sin, you are separated from God. There is no fellowship between you and God. You remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, I know the Bible says God came looking for them as was his usual habit. He would come at the close of the day, at the pool of the day, that's in the evening, to come and fellowship with them. But they were nowhere. They said, Adam, where are you? They said, we are hiding. Why are you hiding? You know the woman you gave me. See now blame has done. Instead of just saying we are sorry, we, we disobeyed you. The man says the woman you gave me. Now it has become the woman you gave me. And when you was given the woman bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. And I shall call her woman. Now it has just become that woman. And when the woman is asking that snake, it's a of repenting. So God in his wisdom did not go to the serpent to ask what happened. Because he knew even the serpent would have an excuse. So he pronounced a curse on the person who started the talk. And that's what I'm saying. When you sin, you lose fellowship with God. It becomes very hard for you to pray. It becomes very hard for you to read the word. It becomes very hard for you to mix with brethren. You start saying, maybe I'm going to cook up again. No, I'm going to die. But I'm going to go to the house. Because there's something you're trying to hide. Choosing sin alienates you from God and robs you of your peace. Out of one man. Colossians 1 21. For the first one I read, God's fellowship is 2 John 9. Listen to that one. Uh, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If you continue following the word of God, you have both the Father and the Son. But when you continue sinning, the Lord says you do not have what? God. That's what I'm saying, you also lose God's fellowship. And then choosing sin. And let you from God and robs you of your peace. How to put a man in your mind? Colossians 1 21 says, Once you are alienated from God and you are enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. 
ukiwa na tabia ambayo ni potovu unatenganishwa na ushirika na Mungu ilazi kwa Qur'an ya Kiswahili choose to read choose to see robs you of your dignity and honor Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 to 13 this all the bible says have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness but rather expose them for it is shameful even to me mention what the disobedient do in secret but everything exposed by the light becomes visible it is shameful even to mention the sin that people do in secret but even if it is shameful the bible says we must expose everything by the light that is why sometimes we have to stand here and make an announcement about something we don't do that because we want to embarrass anyone and i always say a good christian when you 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 found yourself caught up in issues go and see your pastors immediately they will help you where an announcement needs to be made from the group it will be made from the group where we need to deal with that thing somewhere in the periphery we do it because not everything will be announced from the group i want to tell the Lord says we must expose everything to light yes they have been done in secret he says sometimes it's not even good to mention because the things that are done in secret are very dark things and there is some of them are done at night there are things of the darkness and they are done at night to add the darkness on top of the darkness that is there and in conclusion we must instead of paying the price for sin we must start paying the price for discipleship discipleship is accepting that you are a weak christian there's nobody who is perfect and then allow somebody to speak into your life allow somebody to help you walk alongside you to make you stronger somebody who has been there before somebody who is stronger somebody who has walked the christian walk for years let them hang around those people they will help you also walk with god for those many years not that they are perfect but they have an experience that's what we say the biggest problem we have today most people cannot explain what salvation is they have never had a conversion experience nowadays people are children are born in christian homes you have informed your parents going to church and praying and reading the bible and you just doing the manual there were some years ago people had a damascus experience where you can point a day a time at the event now these people can give us one more space and they can't tell you that they don't have a, a Damascus experience. That is why it is very hard for someone to live a Christian life. Because you know, you know, you, 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 you can be able to easily demarcate where you are coming from, where you are, and where you are going. Nowadays it doesn't happen. Don't be deceived into thinking you can master sin by yourself. You cannot master sin. Sin is very powerful. you are very fake song. Oh no, 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 Shaitani. Kameshiko. 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 It's a lie. He also has his power. He's also very powerful. Remember, he left heaven with a third of the angels. Gabriel Akabaki na third. Michael Akabaki na third. Kuna angels walikuwa wa worship. Na wangu wa kali. Dono nanga hapa hili mwanamziki ya kipuja hapa upa. Nanga hili kipuja watu the other day. Kwa hili kwa hili kwa hili kwa hili kwa hili kwa hili by morning na kwa nakuja saa kumi chetani hakuna nguvu ya kufuta watu are you understand what i'm saying yeah don't be deceived into thinking that you can master sin by yourself you can't you need somebody to walk alongside you you need breath that's what we you know you know somebody say when you, those who have used fire that i have tried when i was a scout and you go to camp and you cook with fire uh, when you remove one log or one stick from the fire does it continue to burn it 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 it, uh, it dies out but when those sticks are together they burn the, even the fire becomes even more intense so when you are with brethren they will be able to spy into greater works they will be able to spy into into grow they will encourage you to grow but when you are alone even the woman is saying i've never seen policemen walking along with a gun 
Do you know where they walk into? Wanasema bunduki moja inachunga ile bunduki They strength in tools. Hata Ecclesiastes 2:2 anasema hivi. A, 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 a rope of three strands is stronger together. When two lie together, God gets caught. Whatever that means. He continues to say, when one falls down, then somebody to raise them up. That is why it is important. You can't pass that sin alone. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. It says, These are very common verses, especially verse 13. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up and reach. You cannot master sin alone. You also need God in the process. And lastly, only in Christ is victory achieved. The only way you can be able to achieve victory over sin is to be in Christ. Ephesians chapter 6. We only read this when we are when we are leading a prayer session. 6, 10, 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers in the dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to you have done everything to stand. All we need to do is to be obedient to God's word and to be submissive to his truth and you will be saved. Washington, please come. Huh? I'd like us to, to take some time to pray. I know I've taken like, some more time, more extra 10 minutes. Uh, I'll let us to take some time to pray. I'll let us to stand on our feet. I want us to just think about our lives. I want you to think about your life. Is there anything in your life that you need to, when you look at the story of Adam and Eve in the garden, when you look at the story of Samson in Judges chapter 16, and it is good if you go back on just with chapter 14, the story of Samson. Is there anything in your life that you know you are born against God's work? And remember, we are not perfect. So we need to take some time and speak to God in your own words. In your own words. Samson, we have seen how we fail 
in our Christian work. We have seen how we start getting into sin and staying into sin. We want to open our hearts, Lord. We pray that, Lord, you're going to shine your light into our hearts. That if there's any dark spot, point it out to us that, Lord, we may do something about it. Because we know your light shines upon darkness, upon night, and makes it day. And we pray that, Lord, you're going to forgive us for all the times we have lived in disobedience. For all the times that we have not hidden to your word. For all the times we have seen knowingly and sometimes unknowingly. For the times that we have attracted your wrath. But not because of your gracious, compassionate love. You have kept us alive. We want to pray that Lord, the dignity that you have lost because of sin, that you are going to return it to us. The strength that you have lost because of sin, you are going to return it to us. Because the word says that you will uphold us with your right hand. And we pray that Lord, you are going to uphold us with your right hand. Where we are weak, you are strong on our behalf. Where we are poor in spirit, you are going to make us rich in spirit. Because we know without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be able to live our Christian lives. Lord, cleanse these temples that are supposed to carry your presence. Cleanse us, Lord. Like David says, cleanse me with the soul that I may be clean again. Help us all to put on the full armor that we are able to desire and see sin coming, that we will apply the weapons of the Spirit in every situation, that God will emerge victorious. Because we know there are many powers in the heavenly places and the principalities are too great. But we know with your strengthening, with your power, with your Holy Spirit in our lives, we will be able to circumvent, we will be able to win against the Spirit. I thank you, Lord, that if there is anyone here who is repenting of a sin that they have committed, I pray for your forgiveness. I pray for your cleansing. And it is in, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 As you are standing like that, I would like to pray for your offering. Just hold it in your hand so that I can pray. Hold it in your hand. Um, I'll be there too. Are you putting up the the payment? You can still pay, it, but there's a, on the wall there we have one on that side. We have another one there. Uh, in, well, nowadays our wallets are in our phones. You can be able to communicate with the with the payment and send something to that account. So let us just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you this afternoon for the time that we had in your presence. We want to give thanks Lord for the blessings that you have to us. Some of them are spiritual, some of them are physical. And Lord, we want to worship you back by giving into your house. And for those who are paying their tithes, I want to pray that Lord, you're going also to receive that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.